Hey, it's Rachel. I have previously shared a simple crop rotation system that I used to use with my smaller garden. I still love it, but now that I am moving to this larger property and growing more of our food, I am finding that I need to mix up the rotation. I thought it would be beneficial to walk through first that simple rotation because I do think that it's valuable for anybody that's growing a smaller garden with a nice mix of plants in it. And then I'm going to walk through why I changed it, how I'm changing it, and also my use of cover crops as I go through this. Why are we even talking about crop rotations? Mostly it's an issue for big commercial farms, but it can be a problem with small gardens as well. If you grow the same plants, at least plants in the same family, in the same locations over and over again, year after year, a couple of things can happen. The first is you can have issues with disease and insect pests because the pathogens will find their favorite host and the insects will find their favorite food source consistently in the same spot. You don't wanna have that happen. The second issue is nutrient deficiencies. Certain plant families tend to rely more or less heavily on specific nutrients. And if you plant the same thing over and over in the same spot, eventually you can deplete key nutrients out of your soil. Moving your plant families around can really help with this. For my smaller garden in our last home, I used a simple rotation system as I mentioned before. I would group the beds into one of two types, where half of them were treated as spring and fall beds, and then the other half were treated as summer and winter beds. I would then alternate each bed between the types year over year. I'm going to start by showing the rotation as if I only had those four beds, because I think it can be helpful for anybody with a smaller garden. If we start with a spring bed that first year, then after those crops are harvested, it would be planted with fall crops. The second year, you could then grow just summer crops in them. If you wanted to pre-plant some crops for overwintering, that would be the approach to get an earlier spring harvest. And then that could also be followed by a fall planting. The fourth year, if you wanted to have some winter gardening, you could plant your summer crops and then follow them with winter crops and the whole cycle would then repeat. To show you just how much variety you really can get with a simple rotation, I have mapped out the families going through these beds over that cycle. The main image in the bottom center is a plan view of my spring bed drawn to scale. And I've gone really nerdy here and color coded the plants by their families, matching the colors to the legend at the top right. Those are the Latin names, just to forgive me in advance for my pronunciation of them all through this video. The chart at the top then shows the total square footage over time that's been growing families of each type as you move through the cycle. You can see that when we start with my spring beds, it's mostly Chinopo DACA, the spinach and beet family, as well as brassicas like broccoli and kale, and then a little bit of Asteraceae coming in the form of lettuce. Moving to the fall plantings that same year, you can see slightly different crops because I'm adding spinach, but overall it's the same plant families. This changes dramatically as I move to the second year and grow summer crops only. This is mostly tomatoes and peppers in the Solanaceae family, as well as squash and melons in the Cucurbitaceae family, with some beans thrown in from the legume family. When those are all harvested and I pre-plant the crops for the next early spring harvest, you can see more of those cool weather plant families again coming back. But now I am also adding some specific onions that were recommended for overwintering, and those add a bit of allium family to the mix. I'll follow that with a fall planting of more cool weather crops. And then in the final year, I would plant this as a summer and winter bed, starting with more Solanaceae again and some legumes. But then with the winter planting, you get one more family in the form of carrots, and that is in the Umbella foray family. That approach worked really well for me, and I do recommend it still for anybody with a reasonably sized garden. I now have an unreasonably large garden, and I will be growing a lot of things. In particular, I'm going to be growing tomatoes for canning and peppers for slicing and freezing, as well as some storage crops, including potatoes, sweet potatoes, and onion and garlic. My issue is twofold. One, at any given time, I'm just growing a lot of plants in the Solanaceae family, and I'll map that out for you. But it's like almost half my garden uh, is gonna have plants from that one family in it. And then my second issue is that I cannot just spread these guys around in a polyculture First, because they're just too much of the mix, but second, a lot of these plants have to be dug up in order to be harvested, and there's really no way to intermix those crops with other crops. You kind of have to harvest the whole bed all at once, just how it works. Here is the layout for all 10 beds, again drawn to scale with the plants coated by family. Even zoomed out like this, you can visually see in all of this gold color here, my main concern, namely that I'm growing a ton of plants in the Solanaceae family, 
And I'm at the point where I have almost half of my garden growing this family at any point in time. The further bad news is that Solanaceae are subject to a variety of diseases like early blight, late blight, septoria leaf spot, bacterial wilt, fusarium wilt, and verticillium wilt. I have personally had one case of verticillium wilt and it was only one tomato and it had this big wound on the side from rubbing on the trellis. Still, it freaked me out. Uh, you know, even though it's kind of a one-off situation, it tells me that those pathogens are present in my environment and if I'm not careful, I could have a dramatic issue with this. So I'm gonna do everything I can to prevent it. All right, I'm gonna walk through now how I have redesigned my system to reflect the fact that I need to be careful with the Solanaceae plants. I now have a 10-year cycle, not a four-year cycle, and as I was laying this out, I was worried in particular about four beds. One of them is a bed that's gonna be full of nothing but tomatoes. One is a bed that's going to grow potatoes. And then the other two are those seasonal summer beds that are still in my rotation. Those do have a little bit more variety in them, but they're still very heavy on Solanaceae plants. I started by placing the two worst point loads, which is the bed full of tomatoes and the bed full of potatoes, as far away from one another as possible in this rotation. I then took the two summer polyculture beds that contain a lot of the same plant family, and I tried to put those two as far away as I could from the first two. Ideally, I would have two full years off with no Solanaceae crops in between rotations, but I can't quite get there with my number of growing beds. I made sure I always had at least one year with no Solanaceae plants, and that's the best that I can do. For the years in between, I focused on planting them with crops from totally different families, sweet potatoes, broccoli, my spring and fall polycultures, onions, and finally winter squash. I'm gonna do a quick call out on garlic here because it is the oddball. It is essentially a complementary growing season and it ends up being almost a mini rotation of its own. Garlic takes a long time to grow. It gets planted in fall for harvest late the next summer. And I've shown it off to the side here, bridging between the sweet potato and broccoli plantings. I will plant the garlic right after I harvest out the sweet potatoes, and I will factor in the future placement of my broccoli plants when I'm putting in the garlic. The next spring, I will set out my spring broccoli transplants around those garlic cloves. I can harvest that garlic around August, and that is right around the time that I would typically turn over the broccoli bed anyway and set out my fall broccoli transplants. So the fact that I have to dig up the garlic is not a problem. Going back to my visual color coding system by family and using it here on the 10 year cycle, you can see that each bed does get a nice variety of plant families rotating through it over the full 10 year cycle. And most importantly for me, these blobs of intense gold color are pretty reasonably spaced out. I mentioned I couldn't quite get where I wanted with a two full years off with no Solanaceae plants. The good news is I have a another weapon in my arsenal here and that is cover crops. I'm going to be using those a lot more intentionally on this larger garden for general soil health and in particular there is one which is mustard greens or brassica, I think yunkia, I probably have that latin wrong, but that is a particular crop that is used and studied as a biofumigant. When that mustard is turned under and it decomposes in the soil, it releases allyl isothiocyanates or AITCs, much easier for me to pronounce, uh, these are the chemicals that give mustard, horseradish, and wasabi their kick, and they can act as a helpful fumigant against a variety of diseases, including verticillium. Now, on its own, this is hardly bulletproof, but it is a useful weapon to bring to the table, and I still get all of the cover crop benefits that I know and love. Those include more organic matter in your soil from the cover crop and its roots, weed suppression because the soil is already covered, ground cover and shade, for the soil that protects it from solarization in the sun, the prevention of splashback of disease pathogens getting from the soil up onto your crop leaves because you've got the cover crop in between. And if I let the mustard set flower, I can provide pollinator support while I am at it. Fun random bonus, I could in theory also make my own Dijon mustard. Since my goal is to use the cover crop to fumigate the soil for the benefit of one particular plant family, I have to be thoughtful about where I put it in the rotation in order to get the maximum benefit. In my case, it means I need to use mustard as a cover crop the year before the beds get the tomatoes, peppers, and potatoes in them. And that means planting it into my onion, squash, broccoli, and my spring slash fall polyculture beds, respectively. I want to leave it long enough to flower, but not long enough to set seed. I was kidding about making my own mustard. I do not want this dropping and ending up with mustard every year. Hitting that window means about 45 to 50 days after I sow the seeds. So I would plan to sow those mustard seeds directly into the beds around the planned main crop. 
and do it about seven weeks before those are ready for harvest. Mustard isn't the only cover crop I plan to use because it lacks one important benefit and that is fixing nitrogen. And nitrogen is super important for most plants, but it's particularly important for your heavy feeders. That includes tomatoes, peppers, broccoli, and squash. And I wanted to make sure that I got some of that in there as well, along with a couple of other cover crops for different reasons. There are three more cover crops that I plan to use. One is subterranean clover. Uh, this will fix nitrogen and it will also reliably winter kill for me. That was important to me. I don't want clover popping up any more than I wanted mustard seeds popping up everywhere. That clover will go underneath all of my tomatoes and peppers to help give them a boost of nitrogen as well as attracting pollinators with their flowers. I've shared before how much I like using buckwheat as a quick cover crop in between spring and fall plantings. I used to use it in all of my spring fall beds, but since I am now adding mustard into my rotation, the only rotation bed that gets this is now my early spring bed. Last but not least is alfalfa. Uh, this also fixes nitrogen, but it also has the benefit of really deep tap roots that can help break up subsoil. And with my levels of clay, this is definitely helpful. I plan to plant alfalfa as a quick fall cover crop in the potato and sweet potato beds after I harvest those out in late summer. The alfalfa should have time to grow to maturity and set some flowers to help the pollinators before it dies back eventually in the winter. That is the full walkthrough and logic of the crop rotation that I'm using here as my garden is getting larger. I know this was a ton of information, so if you have questions that I didn't cover, please put them below. I hope that this was helpful and useful, whether you've got a small garden and you can stick with a simple system, or if like me, you're starting to scale up and you gotta get a little more intentional with your crop rotations. And then in general, I assume we're all planning our gardens right now, including some rotations. So if you have an approach that you like and you'd like to share, please, please put it below. Otherwise, until next time, I hope this one was helpful. Thanks.